The colony forming cell assay is an in vitro quantitative assay used in the study of hematopoietic stem cells. The assay is based on the ability of hematopoietic progenitors to proliferate and differentiate into colonies in a semi-solid medium in response to cytokine stimulation. The colony's form can be enumerated and characterized according to their unique morphology. The goals of this video are to provide researchers with the basic methods to consistently perform the CFC assay, as well as with useful tips to accurately score hematopoietic stem cell differentiation and proliferation. This will be accomplished by first briefly walking through the CFC assay protocol. The second portion of the video will show data examples and present tips on how to evaluate and score the various cell types that are grown using the assay. Aliquots of methylcellulose-based media should be prepared prior to use in the CFC assay. Use of media aliquots will expedite assay preparation and execution as well as prevent media degradation during freeze-thaw cycles. When aliquoting methylcellulose-based media, remember to mix the bottle thoroughly by vigorously shaking and allow the air bubbles generated during mixing to escape prior to pipetting. If using media that already contains serum or BSA, it is important to minimize the amount of time it is stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. Proteins in the serum and BSA can start to precipitate, leading to a cloudy media. Next, aliquot the media into a sterile 5 milliliter tube. Due to the high viscosity of methylcellulose-based media, the use of a sterile 14 gauge laboratory pipetting needle and a 5 mil syringe is required for accurate measurement. The exact amount of media to be aliquoted will vary depending on the type of media and number of replicates for each experiment. These recommended aliquot volumes for human and mouse CFC assays can also be found in the detailed written and online protocols. Aliquot should be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius in a manual defrost freezer. Begin by thawing the methylcellulose-based media at room temperature for 30 to 60 minutes. While the aliquots are thawing, resuspend the cells in 10 milliliters of media. Note that the recommended media differs for human and mouse preparations. Centrifuge your cells at 400 times G for five minutes. After centrifugation, carefully discard the supernatant and resuspend the cell pellet in a small volume of pre-warmed media in a 5 milliliter tube. Cell resuspension solution for human cells and IMDM plus 2% FBS for mouse cells. Count the viable cells using a hemocytometer and a 10 microliter cell sample diluted in 0.4% tripan blue. Viable cells do not turn blue. Calculate the total number of cells needed for the assay. The cell concentration plated will impact colony counting at the end of the assay. Too few cells will produce insufficient colonies, while too many will make counting individual colonies difficult. These tables indicate recommended cell numbers for the human and mouse CFC assays. The tables can be found in our detailed online protocols. If using a new cell sample, it may be helpful to plate at multiple concentrations to determine the correct plating density. Also note that cells isolated from fresh tissue often require higher plating densities than cells used from frozen stocks. After determining the required cell number, transfer the appropriate volume of cells into a 5 milliliter tube and adjust to the desired cell concentration for use in the assay. Next, add the appropriate volume of cell suspension to the methylcellulose aliquot and vortex vigorously. Depending on the specific assay and media requirements, supplements and cytokine additives may be required in the methylcellulose prior to the addition of cells. Allow the air bubbles to escape by placing the aliquot at room temperature for 15 to 30 minutes. To plate the cells, use a sterile 16 gauge needle with a 3 milliliter syringe. Add 1.1 milliliters of the final cell media mixture to each 35 millimeter petri dish or each well of a 6 well plate. Make sure to use non-tissue culture treated plates. Next, spread the media evenly by gently rotating and tapping the plate. Remove remaining air bubbles with a pipette tip. It is important to ensure that the plates do not dry out while in culture. This will cause more gelation than desired, which will not allow colonies to grow properly and will reduce visibility within the media. Petri dishes should be placed into a larger plate containing an extra dish of sterile water. For six well plates, the void spaces should be filled with sterile water. To maintain humidity, it may be necessary to place the plates in a Tupperware container along with wet paper towels. Place plated cells into a 37 degrees Celsius incubator with 5% carbon dioxide. Maintain the culture for 13 to 16 days for human cells or six to nine days for mouse cells. 
Avoid disturbing the plates during incubation to prevent shifting of the colonies. After the incubation period, the resulting colonies are counted based on morphology and color. A grid is a useful way to stay oriented during counting and will prevent counting the same area twice. A sample grid available in the online protocol can be printed on transparency paper and attached to the bottom of the plate. Alternatively, a grid can be made manually by drawing on the bottom of the plate. Tally colony types as you scan through the plate. It is important to maintain consistency in your counting method. As an additional level of validation, it is useful to compare colony counts across multiple independent individuals. Morphological identification of colonies can be difficult. This slide lists the colony types that may form in the assay. The following slides will contain images that demonstrate some key features to help distinguish each cell type under the microscope. The easiest colony type to identify is BFUE, or burst forming unit of erythroid cells. Colonies are reddish in color and typically consist of large, tightly packed cells. These images illustrate variations in human cell colony formation. Note that colonies can consist of single or multiple clusters. The intensity of the red color will vary depending on colony size and the length of time in culture. Smaller, younger colonies will have a more reddish brown color, as shown in the image on the right. Mouse BFUE colonies have a slightly different morphology compared to human cells. In these two examples, mouse BFUE colonies are more tightly clustered and have a less intense red color. Again, the red color will vary depending on time and culture. Colonies observed on day 6 of the assay will be brown or tan, as shown in the figure on the left, while those on day 8 will be significantly more red, as seen in the image on the right. At a higher magnification, one can visualize the characteristic appearance of BFUEs as very small, tightly packed clusters of cells. CFUE colonies, which represent more mature erythroid colonies, can be distinguished by their smaller size, more tightly packed colonies, and less intense red color compared to BFUEs. These two images are examples of human CFUE colonies. Now compare them to this image of a human BFUE colony. CFUM colonies, or macrophage colonies, consist of large, smooth cells that are loosely aggregated. The characteristic appearance is common for both human and mouse cells and is illustrated in the high magnification image of the human CFUM colony on the left. CFUM colonies can vary in size from small clusters as seen in the middle image to larger, more spread out clusters as seen in the image on the right. CFUG, or granulocyte colonies, can be distinguished from macrophage colonies by their smaller cell size and generally more compact centers, as seen in the images of human cell colonies on the left and in the middle. CFUG colonies have a similar appearance in mouse cells as seen in the image on the right. The differences between CFUG and CFUM colonies can be clarified using a side-by-side -side comparison. Human CFUG colonies on the left are clearly smaller in cell size compared to the human CFUM colonies on the right. In addition, the granularity observed in the CFUG colonies is in contrast to the smooth, round appearance of macrophage cells. CFUGM colonies, which consist of both macrophages and granulocytes, have a composition of CFUG and CFUM morphologies. Human and mouse CFUGM colonies typically have a compact center of smaller granulocyte colonies and a loosely packed periphery containing large macrophage cells. To accurately identify these colonies, it is important to view the cell cluster across multiple focal planes. CFUGM colonies can be easily mistaken for CFUM or CFUG colonies when viewed in a single focal plane, which may make the small cells in the compact center of the CFUGM appear large, like macrophage cells, or larger macrophages appear like smaller granulocytes. The final colony type is the CFU gem, which contains a mixture of granulocytes, erythrocytes, megakaryocytes, and macrophages. On the left is a low magnification image of a human CFU gem that shows the colonies having the obvious red color of the BFUE. The higher magnification image on the right illustrates the complex morphological features of the CFU gem colony, which contains both the small, compact granulocytes and the large, round macrophages. Viewing the cluster in multiple focal planes is again important to ensure that the colony contains all of the gem cell types. CFU gem appearance is similar for human and mouse cells. Biotechni recognizes that successful growth and enumeration of hematopoietic cell colonies is dependent on factors such as accurate and consistent cell counts. 
the presence of growth factors and or cytokines, adequate humidity, and the use of high quality media. With this in mind, Biotechni offers a broad selection of methylcellulose-based media to support human, mouse, and rat HSC growth and differentiation. We hope you have found this video tutorial to be helpful. Please refer to our website to find a complete list of CFC assay reagents and detailed written protocols.